Welcome to Faith and Labor, which is a podcast video series exploring the history of Catholic social teachings and how it can be used to bridge divisions and guide humanity to solve the great challenges facing the working class. Hosted by John Andrzejczyk of Labor Lines and myself, Evan Papp of Empathy Media Lab, we discuss history, scripture, encyclicals, current events, and how faith and love is needed to strengthen solidarity and heal a world in disarray. For episode four today, we will discuss Laborum Exorcens, which means through work and is an encyclical written by Pope John Paul II in 1981 on human work. It is part of the larger body of Catholic social teaching, which traces its origin to Pope Leo VIII's 1891 encyclical, Rerum Novarum, which we discussed in episode one of Faith and Labor. John, long time. How are you doing? Yeah, long time, Evan. Thank you for your uh, patience and all this. And then early this morning, my internet crashed and I was, you know, we, we like to call that first world problems in our family, but I, but I just did, kept doing the reboot, you know? So it's good to see you through work, which is sums it up, which is a title, what's a title supposed to do? Because in this encyclical, as in Catholic teaching, uh, through work, humanity is to be improved. That the product, John Paul, St. John Paul now, speaks of that man is the subject of work, that the work is there to make him better and her better. And it's not a result of original sin. It's not a punishment. And it's it, it's not the object of work. And so once again, 80 years after the first, basically the fundamental, like you mentioned, John Paul, who labored in rock quarries during World War II under the Nazi regime, and uh, in my opinion, maybe uh, one of the, the first modern pope with his travels in the 80s, truly associated with labor in Europe with his countrymen and women in Poland and the Solidarity Movement, which was basically the, one of the only worker movements in the 20th century that overthrew the government. Yeah, as you mentioned, and he became pope in 1978, and he was the first non-Italian pope in 455 years. Mm -hmm. And what's kind of interesting about this transition in 1978, he was elected Pope by the second papal conclave of 1978, which was called after John Paul I, who had been elected in August to succeed Pope Paul VI, who died only after 33 days. And it had become customary for popes to publish new writings on social issues at 10 year intervals since Rerum Novarum. But he couldn't do it because there was an assassination attempt against Pope John Paul II two days earlier. So he published Laborum Exorcins a few months later in September 1981. And as, as you mentioned, Pope John Paul II was very close with a lot of the trade union movements in Poland. Pope John Paul II knew Lech Walesa, who was a trade union activist in Poland, who was really organizing against Soviet rule in his, his native country, Poland, and eventually became president of Poland after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So it's it is a very interesting history and a lot of violence around mm -hmm. that period of transition and, and even on Pope John Paul II. Right. Uh, there were two assassination attempts. But for one, he said one one hand pointed a gun and another hand guided the bullet. <laughs> he credited Blessed Mary, Virgin Mary, Mother of Christ, for uh, saving his life. He dedicated his life to Mary, actually. And once again, and, he, and John Paul had been struck by a military transport in Krakow, returning from the stone quarry where he was working under the Nazi occupation. And the next car come by was a staff car, and the German officer had his men, John Paul or Karl, to a hospital. The second one's actually Benedict, who was forced into the Nazi youth, Hitler youth, and deserted in 45, caught at a checkpoint, and the guards there, instead of following their orders to summarily execute any deserter, told him, he was 15 years old, told him to go home. So I, I, find, I find that kind of interesting note there. But Evan, right, and, you know, I, you know, we talked in the past about what was going on as these encyclicals come out, these teachings, encyclical, I mean, they, they cycle them, they, they send them around to the various authorities within the church, including, well, amounts of associations of different rites. Um, but what was going on there in Poland was very moving, was actually thrown out of the Gdansk shipyard because of his agitation. And uh, as I read in Timothy Garden Ash's recount of that, with a Mary, a Virgin Mary pin on his lapel, climbed the wall, climbed the fence and got in there and they took it over. But we also had in the same era in the West, 
we had Margaret Thatcher's crushing of the UK miners and uh, Ronald Reagan crushing the uh, professional air traffic controllers. And John Paul, a few other things quickly here. John Paul, youngest Pope in, I don't know how long, a very young man, uh, which is, it goes against the tradition, and took part in Vatican II. And in this encyclical, he embraces the foundational outlook that Vatican II laid is that the church, and, and we're here we see it still going on, the church, teachings is that the church will turn outward to the world. That was the decision in the 60s, and it was debated. Do we turn inward, turn our back to our world? And the decision was, no, we're going to turn outward into the world. And in this encyclical, he talks quite a bit about the problems people face worldwide, post-colonial. And this conversation is going to build on episode three of Faith and Labor, where we do focus on the Second Vatican, where they moved from having the the entire church service in Latin to ha allowing it to be conducted in the local languages, which obviously opens it up to much greater number of people to understand what the, the teachings are. And, and there's some issues uh, currently with that that we'll discuss later on. Mm -hmm. And something I, I want to begin with is that within the laborum exorcins, it, it kind of focuses on and it builds on the, the book of Genesis, which is the first book in the Old Testament, and that work is an essential part of human nature. And when man who had been created in the image of God, male and female, hears the words, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And it talks a bit about work is an in integral part of human nature, while toil, according to Genesis, was a consequence of sin. So I, I find also that there is a bit of this balance between what work is and toil. And at the same time, there is this connection that being human, there is going to be suffering. There is going to be struggle. Right. There is going to be toil. But at the same point, work is an essential part of what it means to be human. And what it and, and I, I like that tension in a lot of ways because it a lot of people, you know, including myself, is all have all been in the situation where we have to work even though we don't want to. And mm -hmm. it may not be inspirational, but you just have to do it. And that sometimes creates this, this view that, oh, man, I don't want to work. I just want to be on vacation forever. But I think that's also a threat to what it means to be human. If you're, if you're just constantly living a life of leisure, that can also undermine the spirit of, of what it means to be human. Those are, right. And that's an like excellent point. And, and perhaps we could use that as identifier. Again, John Paul in, in this encyclical and popes before and after him say, uh, again, uh, work is for the betterment of humanity, that, that, that the man or the woman should come out in, in better condition and, and, and not the product. And, and, and perhaps that's the divide between work and toil. And again, other p pronouncements by the Pope, other statements, other exposures, excuse me, he actually questioned the idea of retirement, and he certainly embraced suffering as part of it. Uh, our life has suffering in it, and the church's role, obviously, is to address that, not to write it off, not to say, you know, suffer in silence, but just the opposite, that, that we're here to share suffering. We, going back to, to uh, foundational, right? Christ, Christ shared humanity's suffering. You know, and again, the foundational teaching of the church that humanity, man and woman, child, we are made in the image and likeness of God, and uh, the Son of God came down in the human form, embraced humanity, and with us talking about faith and labor, embraced it in a simple family with his guardian, St. Joseph, his stepfather, if you will, being a carpenter. Yeah. I, I, and I always think about, yeah, the, the idea of suffering is, is a part of being human. You, you're born and then you die, and that's obviously not pleasant, but the, the mm -hmm. suffering is not should not isolate us. It should bridge right. us together because we are all part of this, this spiritual and, and uh, cycle of, of what it means to be alive. And, and I, and I like this idea and it kind of challenges a lot of the environmental views where it's through work, man not only transforms nature, adapting it to his own needs, but he also achieves fulfillment as a human being. And indeed, in a sense, becomes more of a human being through the work. And I know there's a lot of environmental circles where that will look at any type of human activity in nature is is anti-environment 
now obviously there is a lot of problems with human pollution and things like that but simply by by man creating something that improves the conditions of human beings that is not necessarily anti-environmental even if it has an environmental impact right and let me flip back because i agree with you because the truth is teaching is then that uh man has the capacity to face these challenges and to handle these challenges of our impact on the environment. We're not the problem, though, as some uh, people will look upon it, that we're the blight. And it's sad to see that, you know, and this needs to be addressed, both economically, environmentally, people look upon it and say, I would love to have children, but, you know, I, it's impact on the environment or, or I can't afford them. But at the very beginning of this encyclical, John Paul really lights up what the Catholic Church embraces, and that's faith and reason. And and I, I and there's actually an institute of faith and reason that he founded, but he, he states that through sciences, and he lists all these sciences, sociology, economics, on and on, how we learn, because people think the church is static, which it isn't, how the church learns more and more about the impact of work, and humanity. And so the Catholic Church, though we always get beat up on Copernicus, the church embraces both faith and reason and looks upon knowledge, science as leading us to God through God's creation. As the more we learn about it, it we're not to fear it, we become more and more in awe of, of God's work. Absolutely. And, and science is a process and technology, he, he mentioned it, is also technology is a great benefit to, to humankind and it can be regarded as a tool, but should never be regarded as a master. Right. And the idea of technology can cease to be man's ally and almost his enemy when the mechanization of work supplants him, taking away all personal satisfaction and the incentive to creativity and responsibility. When it deprives many workers of their previous employment or when through exalting the machine, it reduces man to the status of slave. I mean, that's that's really powerful, but I, I think it does capture uh, a zeitgeist. Absolutely, and once again, we see this through all the teachings, much forethought, much outlook from, from their uh, perspective, the popes, they, as they see what's kind of coming down, you know, on and on from one sickle to the other. That, and John Paul is interesting because some of his message was ignored by the Western media, but he took on Western societies and then our atomization, our hyper-individuality, which we considered a graver threat than many to humanity. And, and the casting aside of the marginal, and he spoke about that. It, again, a fascinating figure, very controversial, which is probably hard to avoid considering how many long he was Pope. When I was studying about him for this broadcast, I, I, did, I learned, for example, that he took on Pinochet in Chile which I was not familiar with. But at the same token, he... he do you, you want to kind of expand what, what you learned about that? I haven't heard that either. And, and well, I mean, Pino, maybe you know, the audience Pino, doesn't know who Pinochet was. Oh, yeah, horrible, yeah. <laughs> horrible episode uh, backed by so uh, Salvador Allende, democratically elected. He was a communist, democratically elected to the presidency of Chile. The CIA got involved uh, uh, basically funded a disruption of the economy, created chaos, which is one of the main tools in the tool bag of any government to interfere with another government. And Augustus Pinochet, chief of staff of the Trillian army, staged a coup. I really can't even speak of the crimes he committed without choking up, taking political prisoners and tying them and throwing them off in the ocean over a plane, on and on. And John Paul faced him face to face and demanded that he give up his power and eventually did it's imperfect they're still they baked into the cake their new constitutions law protections but that was significant to me because Pinochet really embraced typical like Franco in Spain he really embraced a certain version of Catholicism and and pretended to be the guardian of Catholicism, but he didn't fool Wotila, he didn't fool John Paul and so again a controversial figure but we just get this encyclical uh, really, again, when you boil it down, again, speaks of, he repeatedly speaks of man is the object of work. He's not the subject of work. Humanity is work. Francis speaks of this, our current Pope speaks of this, because work is 
the most common form of cooperation humanity will ever know has and always will be. Or in, in the parlance of the left, perhaps it is the most uh, popular of the popular fronts. Everyone goes to work. And we all bring our, our, our um, subjective histories, our lives to it, but we all come to work. And it's foundational. He calls it also foundational for the family, work to, to establish a family, which uh, the church recognizes as the proto part of society well before clans well before tribes well before nation states there was the family to establish a family you have to have work yeah and i find this the historical tension between what's going on in the 1980s between the west and the soviet union or the nato alliance in the soviet union and he comes right out and he's talking about how labor takes precedence over capital, which right. Lincoln used and Marx obviously built a lot of his ideology based on this understanding. But I think it's very clear capital has no value when it's removed from human intention and human use. And labor takes precedence over capital just means people are more important than, than the things. So he's, he's making these pronouncements in the West while he's also trying to help people in the East find the spirituality of Catholicism while also critiquing the capitalism of the West under the Reagan and Thatcher kind of at the very beginning of, of what is going to be unleashed for the last 40 years as you know, known as this neoliberal exploitative model that's really ran its course to a proto-fascist kind of uh, threat right now. And something it, you mentioned as well about the family is there's a lot of thought of on even policies of like what what would achieve a good policy and he, he talks about like a family wage which mm -hmm. is enough to support the worker and his family as a minimum so it's not even a, like minimum wage sometimes is is understood as a floor but i i think if you put it into a family wage where it's like one wage can provide a house can provide enough money to for a wife children future college, all these other things, that's the family wage. And then that's the floor that everyone's supposed to have where women with children have a right to either stay home or to work outside the home with accommodation for their family responsibility. He also talked about the benefits of health insurance, pensions, accident insurance, weekends and vacation mm -hmm. as part of a, a correct relationship between the worker and employer. So these are things that sometimes are denounced as you know, communism, socialism, and things like that. But what he's saying that without these, you're actually going to undermine what it means to the potentiality of the human civilization, species, and, and the community relations between us all. That's an excellent point. A family, a family wage, right? Because you talk about just wage, that, that's still focused on individual minimum wage, even at $15 an hour, you know, FTE, full-time equivalent, that's about $30,000. And, and, and without health insurance at all, it's not going to work there. And right, he calls for a family wage that the family uh, structure can remain intact and allow the family to be the prime caregivers. And uh, yeah, I noted that, and we've had that discussion in our families that the focus by progressives, and I consider myself a progressive or somewhere in there, but more guided hopefully by the Catholic teaching, is on affordable daycare. And it, I, I would like to see that, uh, that, that family wage and at least have the option and let the family uh, decide, husband and wife, wife and wife, however society is going to allow it, uh, how they're going to care for their family, uh, how they're going to deal with work. That's an excellent point. And, you're, and while he was taking on the Soviet Union and took him on in PBS production, Frontline, John Paul, the millennial pope, they recount when he flew to Warsaw and met with the leader of the coup, the general, the general whose name escapes that point, witnesses said that the general's knees were shaking as he stood in the room with John Paul. You know, Stalin's famous line when he was challenged by the popes, how many divisions does the pope have? And John Paul answered that question. <laughs> so, you know, the moral authority. But he speaks, actually, in this encyclical, he says that the worker should ultimately have the control of the production, which is... You know, one could say that's communist. You know, again, uh, if you come to the church, it's teachings to validate you know, your perspective. You may get challenged. Again, the support of the family, traditional roles might disappoint some folks. And then on the other side, he's calling for, he's saying man has to be 
uh, superior over capital. The workers should have control of production. Wow, it's it, it's a challenge, isn't it? Yeah. And like you mentioned, he commended arrangements in which workers share in the ownership, such as sharing mm -hmm. shareholding by workers, joint ownership and profit sharing, which is really, really interesting. He also brings up this point between the direct and indirect employers. Yes. And a worker's direct employer is the person or institution with whom the worker enters directly into a work contract. So that's the traditional way we think about work. But the indirect employers are other persons, groups, and structures that affect or constrain the direct employer. So an example is uh, manufacturing companies in developing world, developed countries that purchase raw materials from less developed countries. So if the purchasers insist on the lowest possible prices, the lowest possible wages in another part of the world, those people are going to be indirect, directly and indirectly affected. So I like this then brings back labor policy and international labor policy that ensures justice for every worker. It is necessary not only to work with the direct employers, but to also to identify and coordinate the indirect employers. And the United Nations International Labor Organization, the ILO, I think is even mentioned yes. within this encyclical. And I think that is one of the one of the places where I think the United States needs to get their foreign policy together is to support more unions, both to help raise wages in the United States, but then to also hold our companies accountable that are going overseas, exploiting and then dumping slave labor goods into our country without suffering a tariff at the minimum and, mm -hmm. and not being investigated for tax evasion and, and all of these labor malpractices. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so he was, John Paul was basically predicting, I mean, the problem there, and then we just see it come to fruition under the current global globalization system. You mentioned neoliberalism, which is antithetical, in my judgment, to Catholic social teaching, the teachings of the mainline uh, Christian churches, and the teaching of, of many humanism, humanistic outlooks is that just a product again once again you just your labor is a product that you're selling again the race to the bottom thomas frank i credit him for that uh, term the race to the bottom we know you and i know those involved in labor know that the trade agreements were toothless when it came to both labor and environmental protections that was just uh, at the best words and uh, we see that all the time, and it's it, and it's it might even get worse because as we try to transition to uh, what we call a carbon-free economy, um, that's going to be so dependent on rare minerals, which come from certain parts of the world that face not only these labor problems but also environmental problems. Absolutely. Another concept he brings up is full employment and mm -hmm. the idea that everyone who can work should be able to get a job. And oftentimes that will raise the wages of workers. So in the history of, of owners, if there's a large pool of unemployed, then they can pit the unemployed versus the employed to make sure that they can control wages. And Pope John Paul II, quote, we must first direct our attention to a fundamental issue, the question of finding work, or in other words, the issue of suitable employment for all who are capable of it. And so that, that really gets into the idea that the, the criterion of full employment will only be achieved through planning and coordination mm -hmm. among all the indirect em employers and a better coordination of education with employment. So it goes back to, you have to work with not just the employers, but the indirect employment, that, that concept of, as well. And that, right, and that brings to me to mind that Pope Leo spoke of this, it, it, again, exploiting that pool of, of unemployed workers, and this won't be verbatim, but uh, uh, Pope Leo said, if, if a worker accepts substandard wages, poor work conditions out of desperation, that's not justified. And he calls it an evil, an evil on the part of the employer to offer that, to take advantage of another human being, because what does the church say that we, you know, and, and I'm at fault as, as well as many, trust me, but we're to, we're, we're to look at that person and see the Christ in them. So the church calls that out. So again, full employment would have to be more than just the desperate people taking poor situations. Absolutely. And he also goes into unions where he, he asserts the importance of workers forming unions and the rights not limited to industrial workers, but belongs to every class and profession. 
And he urges the unions to view their struggle as a positive struggle for social justice. And that striking is uh, very proper and legitimate mm -hmm. in the proper conditions under Catholic social teaching. He calls unions indispensable. And as I said before, a man that spoke, I believe he spoke 15 languages. I believe he was flu literally fluent in 18. But he didn't just grab those words. Indispensable, to me, brings to mind air and water. And, you know, not beneficial, indispensable. But Francis speaks of this also recently. And it comes to mind when he speaks of unions, the Catholic teaching would be uh, good unions, again, for social good. Francis, a few years ago in Italy, said that a union fulfills only half its mission when it serves its members. It must serve those who are yet to be organized. And again, that's fundamental to Catholic teaching. And I think you and I can see that sometimes it gets problematic with uh, our fellow workers and with some labor organizations. While they do have a mandate for their membership, if that's the only thing you worry about, I read once in our in my uh, union paper from electricians, if, if the only thing you worry about are your wages, your benefits, brother, then perhaps you should consider removing yourself from this organization. Well, and even in the most narrow self-interest, it's in your interest to worry about others because yes, right. if someone's being oppressed over there, it's, it's just a matter of right. time till that threat yeah. comes to you. So you are, we are, our brother's keeper as, as it goes, so. Absolutely, or, or what they said out of Nazi Germany when they came for the unions, I wasn't in a union, you know, and then, then you look around, there's no one there. Uh, uh, right, um, the whole, whole uh, a whole subject there of where we're at with organized labor, Evan, but absolutely. And a few, few other points too, he, he goes into the dignity of agricultural work, where mm -hmm. it's oppression of those who actually cultivate the soil by the wealthy landowners. So he really goes there, rights of disabled persons, and obviously mm -hmm. some acts in Congress to actually provide laws that support the, the right of disabled persons. But in the early 80s, that didn't exist in the United States. And then he also talked about immigration and work, and each country should have laws to protect the rights of immigrant workers so that they receive equal treatment. This goes against a lot of the practices of what I see as right-wing circles in the, in the Catholic teachings. Right, and, and also you, you see the blowback uh, from workers blaming the, the migrant worker, but on our current system, my opinion, migrant labor is, is uh, serves the bosses and by again bringing their rights protecting them getting them equitable wage then we would truly see the need for migrant labor and it would not be exploited one against the other i mean that's the old the old trick of exploiting one class against the other one group against the other which in this encyclical obviously but the pope speaks against yeah and just to go back to the, the environmental question, for right now, we see wildfires, we see drought all in California. As a, and as, as an anecdote, there's plenty of water. We just have to get the salt out of it. So what is the cheapest? You need a lot of energy to boil the water, to remove the salt and collect the evaporation and be able to deliver it to millions of people in need. And so we have the technology. Uh, a lot of people are afraid of atomic energy and fission, but this is the most advanced, cleanest form of energy. And I'm, I'm happy to talk to anyone about it who may disagree. But the fact that humans have unlocked this incredible, almost magical technology through reason and through the scientific development to help solve the issues on this earth. And yet we're not doing that work right now to desalinate and ensure that places that are under drought right now are actually being given the water that they need. So I almost look at this as, as well as using our, our technology to improve the environment, to improve living conditions and things like that. And if we're not doing those type of things, then we're actually going against the directional dynamic of, of what it means to be human and, and actually carrying out our, our work and purpose of, of why we are here. I agree 100 percent and nuclear power the nuclear option you had a great podcast uh about that a few months ago it's in the united states especially nuclear power is is strong labor my union i'm retired from that international brother electrical workers strong in in that industry those are good labor jobs but it's 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 fall into kind of the the bailiwick of culture wars and once again you know both sides playing it like a fiddle what unlocked like you say what unlocked the secrets of the atomics 
was uh, what we consider uh, a gift from the creator, and that's man's curiosity of the world around us. And of course, on one side, you have the nuclear weapon, which is the greatest evil. And then on the other side, you have this, this nuclear energy that can be the greatest good if you can have a limitless supply of energy for everyone everywhere. And the environmental movement, this is a, the, the crazy thing about the, the Malthusian, some tracts of Mal, Thomas Malthus, who believed in a Earth's carrying, carrying capacity based on a linear development of agricultural production and, and human population growth is exponential. Of course, his whole theory was flawed in that it didn't account for new development of technology. Mm -hmm. And so deeply embedded with a lot of the environmentalism is this idea of, as you mentioned earlier, humans are a scourge on the planet mm -hmm. right. and that we need to reduce the amount of humans on this planet. And that can go to real dark places very quickly yes. if, that, if that zeitgeist also takes over. And so I think within that, that came about with that nuclear was this going to increase population as well. And so a lot of the, the Malthusian anti-population, anti-growth folks really kind of latched onto that. And we're, we're still dealing with that in a lot of generations. Um, but to, to move on from that, I just, I really, going back to the idea of toil and when we're working and it's just, damn, this, this work is just toil day in and day out. And the spirituality of that endurance, the toil of work in union with Christ crucified for us, man in a way collaborates with the son of God for the redemption of humanity. And that's, that's just, I, I find really powerful. At the same time, I think we need to fight, you know, for our rights, for dignity and everything else in working, but work is, is essential to, to improve our lot. And we've been given so much and we need to build on, you know, the, the thousands of generations that came before us. Absolutely. I work, you know, in conversations with my family. We had one daughter going through, you know, very normal, hard times at work, you know, and I said, you know, in a 10 hour stint, uh, you might go from loving your job to hating your job to loving your job all in 10 hours, you know, let alone a year, right? A lot depends on with, with the labor's union. I go from call to call. And I can look back and uh, what were some of the best jobs? Physically, they're about the same, but some of the best jobs are who I end up working with. Again, what Francis said, it's it's well, it's well, the widest range of cooperation. I mean, this is it. We we literally leave our homes, spend more time at work than our family on that day. Yeah, again, work is man is a subject to work. I had to really read that and figure that out that we're not the object to work, and. Going back to Pope Leo in the first encyclical on work and forward from that, work is not just about provide your fundamental needs, literally fundamental needs. When it's offered in that situation, it's an evil. They all call for the need for rest. Sunday is the Lord's Day, which is real interesting, Evan, because those who taught themselves as pro-family love this economic system where we're, where we're a 24-7 society. And if you got a problem with that, it's your problem. You know, if the, if the, if the boss tells you you got to work on Sunday, that's your problem. So, Yeah, and the importance of leisure with the family and the the ability of of being able to take a step back and have contemplation and and mm -hmm. you need you need some time away from the work and i i pulled this out from the united states conference on catholic bishops on the dignity of work and the rights of workers where it's written work is a duty on the part of man man must work but both because the creator has commanded it and because of his own humanity which requires work in order to be maintained and developed and through work, man not only transforms nature, adapting it to his own needs, but also achieves fulfillment as a human being, and in a sense becomes more of a human being. So I, I do identify with a lot of these words. So just quickly, it goes literally back to the English translation of the title of this encyclical, through work. Through work, you become more human. Through work, you uh, identify with the Christ in, in each of us, or at least have that at work, or our goal, the goal of the church is to have work facilitate that. So I do want to kind of talk a little bit about some, some cultural things called the metaverse and, and just this dystopian idea on this thing that Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook proclaimed Facebook is going to become a metaverse company and Facebook is going to pivot from being a website that is accessed through phones and laptops 
to a next generation computing platform where the focus is on users presence and is accessed through VR via Facebook's Oculus headset. And five years from now, we'll effectively transition from people seeing us as primarily being a social media company to being a metaverse company. So the reason I even wanna bring this up in this, this conversation is the metaverse was born from a novel from 1992 called Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson, where it's this alternative virtual reality where the, the protagonist in uh, Snow Crash, is, his name is Hero, and he's a gig worker delivery driver who moonlights as a hacker and lives in abject poverty in a 20 by 30 foot storage unit he shares with an alcoholic roommate. And it kind of goes into this dystopian place that it's not viewed as cool, but is necessary because this metaverse is the re was created and a lot of people want to go into it because the real world has become so unbearable. Right. And we're seeing that even today, that through lack of meaning in our work, that and, and through just the sheer struggle of, of survival and existence, that people do want to escape and unplug and disconnect from the communities and from the families around them. And if I could just have one, one more point to, to come out here, where it's a book came out, Ready Player, around the same time that talks about, that, that builds on this concept of the metaverse. And that book too is set in this dystopian future where desperate people are driven to escape their unpleasant lives into a vast virtual environment. It is insinuated that either this oasis called as that metaverse is so popular because the world is so bad or the world is so bad because the oasis is so popular. So even by going into the metaverse, you're no longer caring about what you need to do in this, this world now today and help your, your fellow humans. So then that re reduces the attention, for instance, if you're a citizen in making sure the government does what needs to happen so that everyone is fed and everyone ha is housed because you're, you're always just online all the time, entertainment and things like that. And the only reason I bring this up, this was an article on Vice, is that in this weird nexus, which to build out your company's future on this metaverse, Facebook's Oculus division were handed copies of this book as required reading. So mm -hmm. it, it's just kind of strange that the, this dystopian future of where the metaverse is named after it, and it's going to be celebrated. We're going to hear more and more about this going forward. If people who are familiar with Roblox, with all the children using it, I just became familiar because I have uh, nephews and nieces who are playing this game Roblox, which is this metaverse online. And soon the headsets are going to be on. And so as we talk about this idea of work is essential to what it means to be human, there's going to be this inherent tension as more and more people are drawn into this online virtual reality. And I know that's a huge digression, but thank you for uh, entertaining that comment. I, I think it's spot on with John Paul. Once again, he, he in the 80s, well before the universality of cell, cell phones, he called out the West and the message was ignored because there was such triumphalism with the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, he called out that the hyper individuality of the Western model of the atomization society was more perilous to humanity than the Soviet Union. Yeah. And, and, and that's how many years ago, right? That it's the people isolate themselves and in, in by improving, working towards moving from toil to work. And we're, we're the last generation to have lived in existence offline. You know, we're right. some of the last generations to live the existence without a cell phone on us with all everything that that includes. And uh, yeah, it's it's going to talk about the struggle for spirituality in this right. new world. I mean, where is the spirituality going to be on in the metaverse? And, and maybe there will be some on that, because I think inherently in humans, we're constantly trying to seek purpose and meaning. And if there yeah, is absolutely. no purpose and meaning, then deep down, we're going to be afflicted with with tremendous problems but i i don't that that's 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 about all i have i i don't know if you have any closing comments as we discuss just a few current events on on the labor room exorcisms once again john paul controversial figure but those who come uh to have their their positions validated by the church it, it, it's kind of uh, what you call it weak beer uh, it, it's not going to happen right or left so no once again great conversation and uh, a very important milestone of the church teaching yeah 
And just in some current events since our last broadcast, Pope Francis had surgery and it was supposed to be a simple surgery to work on his colon, but mm -hmm. then it ended up actually being an open surgery and, and he was in the hospital for 11 days. And I was getting very concerned, but right. he returned to the Vatican on Wednesday, July 14th. And he's scheduled to resume public and private audiences on August 4th. So I'm very happy about that. And then Pope Francis reverses Pope Benedict's, the restrictions on Latin mass. And you shared some information over the last month about this. I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. Well, um, what I say about, it's very interesting. Those, those who uh, seek out the Latin mass, uh, I say they're nostalgic for something they didn't experience to be a Catholic pre-Vatican too, where we went to the vernacular, the, literally the priest faced the congregation. You, you had mass in your language so you could understand it. I mean, the Last Supper, the first mass, uh, was in Aramaic, I think. Uh, it wasn't even in Hebrew. And they all participated. The apostles obviously didn't have a clue what was going on, but that could be the same anyways. So you'd have to be 80 some years old to say that you participated as an adult in the Latin Mass. I wasn't. I was in eighth grade when I was existing. Well, it was a couple number of years, but we're about that age, 12, 13. So it's young people for whatever reason. I, I think it's, just, it's a reactionary tendency of people to fear change. And it's very isolated. Where I lived in Idaho, it was strong, the Latin Mass, but that whole a reactionary outlook on life. Uh, Sadly, but predictably, as Pope Francis said, it have to be to each bishop to give authorization for a Latin Mass and be restricted where it to be said. Those bishops who have been opposing the pontiff almost immediately gave permission or, in effect, de facto gave permission by saying everything will stay the same until we study the matter. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to be a fly in the wall in the Vatican courtyard where you have former Pope Ratzinger walking around still, and you have Pope Francis there, and you have these two very different ways of what the future of the church looks like in, in both of their intentions. It, it's fascinating intrigue. Yeah, it's an interesting dividing line, interesting dividing line, but Pope Francis' uh, fundamental practice as pontiff, as a vicar of, you know, the vicar of Christ on earth, you know, the steward of the church, as Christ left it, is pastoral, is outreach and communication. And we just see it time and time again that we have this opposition there, but the church uh, will survive it. You know, the church is made up of millions of saints. 99% of them will never get recognized. Well, I really appreciate engaging with you, John, and I'm glad we're able to get back online and uh, keep moving forward with this project. I'm honored, Evan. Thank you for your end. I couldn't do it, obviously. So God bless you. And uh, through all the times, kind of so many challenges, but uh, let's close with this. Um, one could be a pessimist, but it's despair is the greatest enemy. And I, I think the church's teachings, I think Pope Francis would say that, not to put the words in the Pope's mouth, but I just feel despair is the uh, greatest enemy. So we just have to uh, keep looking forward and, and keep having uh, hope in our heart and uh, realize that the mysteries will unfold as we go forward. And with that, thank you for watching episode four of Faith and Labor. We'd love to hear your feedback, ideas, and suggested guests for future shows as we seek to promote what Pope Francis described in Fratelli Tutti as a more just and fraternal world where love shatters the chains that keeps us isolated and separate. In their place, it builds bridges. Thanks, John. Amen, brother. Yeah, God bless. Bye now. Mm -hmm.